You know, I was talking, the preacher and I were talking tonight over there. What a wonderful spirit here tonight. I want you to pray for Doc and Ron as they'll be making their way back tonight. You know, I preach all across America. I'll be leaving here, going to High Point, North Carolina, and then from there somewhere else, but pretty solid for two and a half years. I'm booked all across this country. I preach in small churches. I preach in large churches, conducting revival meetings in churches averaging five, 6,000 Sunday school. But I've never heard any greater singing than I've heard here tonight. I mean that. Here, they're singing tonight, preacher. That's great. And I've got a song that means a lot to me. A lot of people said tonight, want to know if I'd give my life story. And I said, well, I'd rather wait. I'm already, the preacher's asked me to come next year and conduct a soul-winning revival. And I want to wait till I'm back and give my life story more in detail. It's been on nationwide television twice. It's been in every major newspaper in the world. And I'd rather wait and get it here on television, in the newspaper, and then ask the people to come here and hear it and just pack this place out and turn away about four or five hundred. Amen? And I believe God will do it. So I'll share that with you when I'm back here uh, of my life story. But I have a song that I use everywhere I go because it means a lot to me. I remember when I was a little boy and I'd come home, just a teenage boy, and I'd come home as a drunkard, and I'd hear my mother singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved the rich like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I say, would you sing that for me tonight? I want the organist and the pianist to come. I hate to ask you to get up, but I want you to sing it for me. Everybody's standing together. And i tell you what I want you to do. Now, before we sing, I'll ask the amp man to give me a lot of volume tonight because of my voice, but uh, I want you to just turn around. Some of you men, you haven't shook your wife's hand in 15 years. You don't know, you don't know what kind of hand lotion she's using. And uh, why don't you just turn around, shake hands, go right ahead. Now make sure it's your wife, but turn around and shake hands and just say it's good to be here. Turn right around, that's all right. That's all right. Now that way you can get acquainted, see? That's right. Now you can get acquainted. Amen. Now let me ask you this. How many would rather be here than in jail? Let's see your hand. Well, I had two. Lead us in one verse of that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Sing it like you mean it now. to sing that last verse I'd like to change the words to that I'm going to spend more than 10,000 years in heaven I'm going to be there forevermore I won't pray anymore praying will all be over I won't be singing songs about getting people saved I'll be singing songs of praise praising the King of King and Lord of Lords when we've been there for evermore. Amen. Let's sing it together. That's great. Sing that last one. thankful tonight for the amazing grace. We're glad that one day that you reached down in the miry clay and lifted us out and set our feet on a solid rock and established our going and put a brand new song in our hearts. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
May you revive our hearts tonight. May you save that soul that's nearest hell. Don't let one person leave here without saying everything's all right between the Lord and I. And I'll thank you for it in your name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, please. I'd like to preach to you tonight on, oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. I thought tonight, uh, when I heard the testimony of those that's been saved, and some 19 people made a difference today when Jesus passed by. You know, folks, I look back some years ago when all the hope was gone in my life, when it looked as though there was no hope whatsoever, but Christ made the difference when he passed by. And I thank the Lord for it. In John chapter 9, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he sped upon the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. I'll tell you, there's a message right there, if you stop there. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before him had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? Some said this is he. Others said he's like him. But he said, I am he. I am he. Isn't that wonderful? Now, folks, I want you to notice here. Here's a man that had never had the privilege and the honor of seeing daylight as you and I see it today. Here's a man that had never, had never put his eyes upon his mother and his father. He had never had the privilege of seeing the blue eyes of that mother and the blue eyes of that father, and yet all at once he received his sight. Now, can't you imagine? you talking about a revival. Now, here's an old boy. I don't know how he got to where he was at. I really don't. I don't question that. I just read where he met a man named Jesus, and you know, they, brought, they took him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees came up to him, and they were like a lot of uh, backslidden Baptists, you know. They came up there, and they began to ask questions, and the neighbors saw him, and they said, uh, uh, Is this the same fellow that sat and begged? Well, some said he's built like him, and some said he's got hair like him, and some said, Well, his eyes, uh, we don't know the color of his eyes, but I know the expression on his face is the same. In fact, the he even acts like the same fella. And that old boy said, listen, I am he. He listened. He knew who he was, didn't he? He knew something had happened. He didn't have anything to lose, but he had everything to gain. He had everything to gain. And you know what that bunch of Pharisees asked him, said, uh, uh, what happened to you? He said, well, he said, I was walking down the road, and he said there was a pool over here, and he said, I met a man, and his name was Jesus, and he told me, now he took some clay and put it in my eyes, and he anointed that, and he told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he said, I did. And he said, I came back with 2020 vision. Now, folks, you talking about sin. If your eyes ever get open, you'll rejoice. Did you know that? That old boy was happy. Listen, he was thrilled about what had happened in his life. And that bunch of Pharisees said, well, it, it, didn't, it didn't mount anything. He said, uh, uh, he did this on the Sabbath day, and, and he's a sinner. And uh, the old boy said, now, I don't take the time to read all of it. You read it when you get home. And the boy said, well, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. He said, all I know, I was blind, and now I can see. And you know what? They asked him over and over and over, you know, what happened? And he kept repeating and repeating and repeating that he met a man named Jesus and he told me to go wash in the pool and I did and I came back seeing and he said the wonderful thing about it is I can see now that I'm not blind anymore. Isn't that great? You know, I look back some 20 years ago when I was blind and my eyes were open and the Lord saved me and I was thrilled about it and I told everybody about it. That old boy, that bunch of Pharisees, said, well, I just tell you, I don't believe it's the same boy. 
I don't believe it's the same one. The fact is, we're going to take him to his parents. We're going to find out. And so uh, they took the boy. They went to the parents. They knocked on the door. And they got there, and the parents came to the door, and they said, uh, uh, we want to ask you a question. Uh, is this your boy? And they looked. Don't you know that mother and that father was happy? Here's her son that had never had the privilege of looking them in the eyes. And don't you know that that boy undoubtedly put his arms around his father and put his arms around his mother. And he said, Daddy, it's good to see you. How wonderful it is to look into your face and see the beautiful hair upon your head. And no doubt he put his arms around that mother and he said, Mama, listen, I appreciate what you've done for me when I was a little boy and I had the tummy ache and you would take me around and walk the floor with me. But Mama, I'm so glad that I can see you now and how glorious it is. Don't you know they did that? I don't believe that boy stood there just as dumb I think he was rejoicing that he could see his mom and daddy. And that bunch of Pharisees said, Is this your son? And they said, Well, I don't understand it. And a fear of the Jews, they said, I, I don't understand it. Said he left here this morning uh, to go fishing, to go somewhere. And he left here this morning and he was blind and he couldn't see. And how he received his sight, I don't know. And that bunch of Pharisees asked him again, and he said, I've told you four times. I've told you once. I've told you twice. I've told you half a dozen times uh, that I met a man named Jesus. And he opened my eyes. And I'm not telling you anymore. Wouldn't you like to be one of his disciples? That's what he asked. And he got a little preaching in there. See? Now listen, folks. Oh, how my prayer tonight would be that Jesus would pass by. If you're here tonight and you're blind spiritually, your eyes have never been opened, that you'll let Jesus pass by and open those eyes of yours tonight. This is my prayer. You turn over to John chapter 5, and here's another man that made a difference when Jesus passed by. You turn over there, and you'll see a man here that had an infirmity for some 38 years, and he'd go to this pool, and there was a pool called the Pool of Bethesda, and at a certain season of the year, the, the angel would come down and trouble the water, and the first one that would step in that pool was, would be made whole. Every year at that same time, there'd be people coming from all walks of life with all kinds of diseases in their body, all kinds of evil spirits in their body, and the first one that could step in that pool could be made whole. Here's a man for 38 years, no doubt, had gone to every position he could go to, and he'd make his way down to that pool, and finally... He said, I'd like to get in that pool. But he said, every time I go to get in there, he said, somebody gets in front of me and I can't get in. There's a lot of people in Dayton, no hell tonight that's lost, that's been lost for 38 years that would give anything to be saved. But you're in their way and they can't get saved. God send the revival. I preached in High Street here a few months ago. I saw some of those dear old saints hadn't hit the Moner's bench in 40 years. I don't believe you can walk that close to God. If you can walk that close to God for 40 years, you never have to get on your knees and say, Oh, God, I failed you. I'd like to have that recipe. But I saw about three or four hundred of those dear old saints had been charter members of High Street, hadn't bent that old hard knee in so long, and they got down on their knees and they said, Oh God, for 38 years that I've never wept over anybody being lost, and for 38 years I've never tried to get anybody saved, and for 38 years they've been wandering these streets lost without any hope. This man for 38 years would go to that pool hoping that somebody would help him get in, but nobody would help him. There's people tonight in Dayton, Ohio, that's going to hell because of you. You say, I don't believe it. Well, where are you at on visitation night? Shame on you. Some of you haven't darted on visitation so long, you wouldn't know how to knock on a door. You're unconcerned. And people in this city are hungry. They're starving for somebody to come and help them in the pool of salvation. 
but we're unconcerned. This man for all these years, no doubt with a broken heart trying to get in that pool, doing everything in his power trying to get in that pool, and he couldn't get in because he was there lying on a stretcher, hoping that somebody maybe would give him a little shove where he could get in that pool. But you know what? It made a difference one day when Jesus passed by. I want to say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the preacher may turn his back on you. The evangelist may turn his back on you. The church may turn their back on you. Your neighbor may turn their back on you. And the entire world may turn their back on you. But Jesus will not turn his back on you. He cares for you. He'll save you and lift you out of that pit of sin. And he'll bring you to that foot of the cross. For 38 years, and finally Jesus, one day, he passed by. You read it when you get home. And he looked at that man, and he said, I could tell that he'd been in that condition a long time. You know what he said? He began to talk to that man why he hadn't got in the pool. And that man, no doubt, with tears of sorrow running down his cheeks. And he said, Lord, I've tried to get in that pool. He said, nobody would help me. And he said, Lord, there has been times I've come pretty close to getting in, but somebody would step in front of me. Oh, there's people who'd like to be a Christian today, but because of your hypocrite life, they can't get in. They can't get in. You know the easiest place to live a Christian life is right in that pew. Right in that pew. You know where to check a person out is go to their home and check them out. Where you can hide all those sins, see. There's a lot of people that would like to be saved, but because of the hypocrites, they can't get in. I, last week, I preached on the walls of your life, the walls that need to be crumbled down. When Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, he didn't crumble those walls down. The Lord crumbled them down. And I spoke on the walls of your life. And I saw a deacon and his wife come forward, weeping their heart out. And that preacher looked to that deacon's wife and said, What happened to you tonight? And she said, I just got saved, preacher. I just got saved, preacher. And that preacher began to read those cards, and he said, uh, uh, somebody made out the wrong card. And that deacon standing down there with the tears running down his cheeks, and he said, Preacher, no. No, Preacher. He said, Nobody made a mistake. He said, I've been fooling you, Preacher. He said, I got saved tonight. I saw a student from BBC come running down that aisle, and that preacher read that card, and he said, You too? And he said, He said, Yeah. He said, I've been fooling everybody, but I can't fool God. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I preached in my own home church, and I know we don't mind me telling. I preached here about three or four months ago in my home church there where I'm working out of. I don't even remember what I preached. But I saw a staff member come running down that aisle, and he poured his heart out in his wife. And he said, Brother Hodges, he said, I've been fooling you. He said, I'm lost. Oh, listen, there's a lot of people who like to be saved tonight if you get out of their way. This man here said, Lord, there's been times I've come so close to getting in that pool. But I'm so glad to report to you tonight that Jesus made the difference when he passed by. He told that man, he said, get up and go. And that old boy got up rejoice. Why? Because Jesus made the difference. That's why I'm so glad tonight that the Lord makes a difference when he passes by your life. He'll transform your life. He'll take that life that's nothing and make something out of it. I believe with all my heart as I read the Word of God, if you've truly been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you've experienced a second birth from the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you'll have a burning desire and passion in that soul of yours. I don't believe you can hide something that's good. 
I mean that. I think there's going to be more church members in hell than you ever dreamed of. I mean that. I, I call across this country of ours when I'm preaching, I'm seeing more church members saved than anything else. Got their name on that roll. Charter members. Love the church. Love the preacher. Let me tell you something. You better not worry about what that preacher thinks. You better not worry about what this church thinks. You better worry about the Lord thinks. Amen. I think pride, all the pride you need, just enough to take a bath. Bless God, pride's going to send you to hell. Do you know that? This old boy here didn't have any, did he? He said, he said, Lord, and the Lord said, get up and go. He wasn't ashamed to tell the Lord that he really wanted, he wanted to be made whole. The Lord told him to get up and go. We need some people tonight to let the Lord pass by like it did the Apostle Paul. Bless God, the Apostle Paul was a man that literally hazarded his life because Jesus passed by one night and away out of the night and spoke to old Paul's heart and lifted him out of the pit of sin and set his feet on a solid rock and established his going and put a brand new song in his heart. And that's why he said in Romans chapter 9, when he said, Lord, he said, I'd turn my back on you and be a curse if you'd save my kinfolk. Some of you tonight need to let the Lord pass by. you got unsaved husbands, unsaved wives, unsaved daughters, unsaved sons, unsaved nephews and nieces and uncles and aunts, and you've come to the altar, all oh, you've got down here and prayed a little bit, and you've got up with a tear or two in your eye, but have you really put them on the altar, and have you really said, Oh, God, I want you to pass by tonight and save my kinfolk. I'm willing, if necessary, to literally turn my back on Jesus Christ and die and go to a devil's hell if you'll save my kinfolk. Jesus passed by Moses. Moses said in Exodus chapter 2, 32, I believe it is, when he said, Lord, he said you can blot my name out of the book if you'll just take care of my people's sin. In Queen Esther chapter 8, she cried out when Jesus passed by, and she said, oh, God, she said, take my life, but save the destruction of my people. My prayer is tonight, Jesus will pass by and melt that old hard heart of yours and God calls you to come down and weep your heart out for your people that are lost going to hell and you've never shed a tear over them. Jesus makes a difference when he passes by. I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when the Lord saved me, he saved me from something and to something. He didn't save me to sit down and sit. He saved me to get up and get. Bless God, that's what you need. Some of you just excuse the expression, just need a good old dose of salvation and you'll do something. Amen. Quit leaning on the preachers and the churches and, and your own feelings and your own uh, life and so on, just lean on Jesus, get saved, and go out and do a work for him. There's a difference when Jesus passes by. Let me give you some other people that it made a difference when Jesus passed by. We find over in the Gospel of John chapter 11, here's a man when Mary and Martha went to Jesus and said, Jesus, our brother Lazarus is going to die. Oh, listen, Jesus, if you could come, I don't believe that he would die if you'd come. And Jesus said, I got to go about the king's business. And they said, please, please, Lord, if you come, I don't believe our brother will die. He said, don't worry about it. I'm the resurrection. <laughs> Bless God, I don't have anything to worry about tonight. I'm the same as in heaven tonight. When he saved me, he covered my sins, past, present, and future. I'm the same as in heaven tonight. If you read in the newspaper tomorrow, that I died, don't you believe it? I didn't die. Dallas Billington didn't die. Bless God, he just gone to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Lazarus didn't die. He just died for a moment. And Jesus told them, said, don't worry about it. Don't you know that Mary and Martha left there with a troubled heart? They thought, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? They left there, and finally a few days, Jesus came by, 
And uh, Mary and Martha run to him and said, uh, Lord, it's too late. It's too late. He said, what do you mean it's too late? Oh, listen, Lord, he, it's too late. It's too late. Well, he said, what do you mean it's too late? Oh, listen, Lord, he's been dead four days. He's already stinking. He's already stinking. It's too late. You know what Jesus said? He said, where'd you lay? Where'd you lay? Now, no doubt there'd been many false cults out in that cemetery, and they'd been calling for Lazarus. I was driving down the highway a few weeks ago. I heard some, uh, well, no, I started to say preacher, not preacher. I heard some fellow on the radio. Well, let's take care of my people's sin. In Queen Esther chapter 8, she cried out when Jesus passed by, and she said, Oh, God! She said, Take my life, but save the destruction of my people. My prayer is tonight, Jesus will pass by and melt that old hard heart of yours, and God calls you to come down and weep your heart out for your people that are lost, going to hell, and you've never shed a tear over them. Jesus makes a difference when he passes by. I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when the Lord saved me, he saved me from something and to something. He didn't save me to sit down and sit. He saved me to get up and get. And bless God, that's what you need. Some of you just excuse the expression, just need a good old dose of salvation and you'll do something. Amen. Quit leaning on the preachers and the churches and, and your own feelings and your own uh, life and so on. Just lean on Jesus, get saved, and go out and do the work for him. There's a difference when Jesus passes by. Let me give you some other people that it made a difference when Jesus passed by. We find over in the Gospel of John chapter 11, here's a man when Mary and Martha went to Jesus and said, Jesus, our brother Lazarus is going to die. Oh, listen, Jesus, if you could come, I don't believe that he would die if you'd come. And Jesus said, I got to go about the king's business. And they said, please, please, Lord, if you come, I don't believe our brother will die. He said, don't worry about it. I'm the resurrection. <laughs> Bless God, I don't have anything to worry about tonight. I'm the same as in heaven tonight. When he saved me, he covered my sins, past, present, and future. I'm the same as in heaven tonight. If you read in the newspaper tomorrow, that I died, don't you believe it. I didn't die. Dallas Billington didn't die. Bless God, he just gone to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Lazarus didn't die. He just died for a moment. And Jesus told them, said, don't worry about it. Don't you know that Mary and Martha left there with a troubled heart? They thought, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? They left there, and finally a few days, Jesus came by, and uh, Mary and Martha run to him and said, uh, Lord, it's too late. It's too late. He said, what do you mean it's too late? Oh, listen, Lord, he, it's too late. It's too late. Well, he said, what do you mean it's too late? Oh, listen, Lord, he's been dead four days. He's already stinking. He's already stinking. It's too late. You know what Jesus said? He said, where'd you lay? Where'd you lay? I no doubt there'd been many false cults out in that cemetery, and they'd been calling for Lazarus. I was driving down the highway a few weeks ago. I heard some, uh, well, no, I started to say preacher, not preacher. I heard some fellow on the radio, and he was right in Los Angeles, and there was a tape that's playing. He's talking about how many he'd talked to from the dead and how many he'd raised from the dead. And I thought to myself, if it wasn't for buying a new radio, I'd just put my foot to it, but I didn't. I thought, how phony, and yet people will believe that. Let me say to you tonight that nobody, and I say nobody, has got the power to raise the dead except the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Lakin talking about last night the power of Satan. And I'll have to agree with Dr. Lakin that Satan's got much power. He's only one Satan, but there's a lot of demons. But I want to report to you tonight there's one thing the devil can't do, and he can't raise the dead. He can't raise the dead. I'm so glad that only the Son of God can do that because he is the resurrection and because he lives, I shall live also. Bless God, I won't have to die. 
No doubt they'd been false cults out in that cemetery saying, Lazarus! Lazarus! Nothing happened. But when Jesus, the Son of God, walked up to the foot of that tomb, and he hollered and said, Lazarus! Come forth! Let me say to you tonight, he didn't hesitate. He came out of that grave. Why? Because Jesus said he'd come out of it. And bless God, if I get buried tonight, I'll come out of that grave. One of these days I'll hear that voice saying, Carl, come out of that grave. And I'll come out with a perfect body. Bless God. I don't want to make any bad to shout. You ought to get excited over something like that. We find also of the woman that had the issue of blood. And when she had the issue of blood in, in Mark chapter 5, we find for all these years she had this issue of blood. She'd walk all bent over like this. She couldn't straighten up. And she heard the report that Jesus was going to be passing by. And she said within herself, Oh, if I could just get out there when he comes by. If I could just get out there, I've heard about him being the Savior of the world. I've heard about him being the divine healer. I've thought about him, the one that everybody's talking about. I've heard about him. I've read about him. I've heard my neighbors talk about him. If I could just get out there, and when he passes by, if I could just talk to him for a minute, I could get this blood taken care of. The Bible said she'd gone to every position she'd gone to, and it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and there was no hope whatsoever. And finally she heard the crowd coming down the road, and she said, that's him. That's him. And she took that apron off and she throwed it over on the couch and she ran out the front door. Here come the neighbor out. Here come a neighbor out. Here come a neighbor out. And they were all going. But every one of them were going out of curiosity. Every one of them were going for sightseeing. Every one of them were going just to see what he looked like. But she was going because she had a need in her life. And she knew she could get it taken care of. And she got there and she got as far as she could and she couldn't get up to where he's at. The multitude of crowd was walking along beside him and behind him, and she was wringing her hands saying, Oh, if I could just get up there to where he's at, if I could get to where he's at. And she made her way up to the side here where when he passed by, and when he came by, she said, Oh, if I could just reach out, and if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I know I could be made whole. And Jesus, with that heart of passion and with that heart of concern, and he felt that need in his heart, and he's felt a need in her life, and he turned around and he said, Woman, thy faith has made thee whole. And she straightened up and went home. Oh, it made a difference when Jesus passed by. She'd gone to every physician. She'd gone to everybody she could go to. You read over in Mark chapter 2. Here's a man here that had the palsy for all these years. And four men heard that Jesus was going to be passing through. And they said, oh, if we could just get this man to Jesus when he passes through the town, if we could get him to him, he could take care of his need. He could take care of his need. You know what they did? They made him a stretcher. They went down, knocked on the door. And the wife come to the door and said, we want to see your husband. And they said, what do you want? He's in there in the bed. He can't get out of bed. He's got palsy had for all these years. And they said, that's why we're here. We're concerned about him. Oh, I wish you could get that concerned about Dayton, Ohio. I wish you could get that concerned about people that are lost tonight. These four men had a burden for that man. They knew if they could get him to Jesus that everything could be all right. If God's people tonight could realize the need and the lives in this city and so I'll do anything to get people saved. Those four men put him on that stretcher. They started up that hill and they got down to that house where Jesus was and the multitude of people and they said, well, we can't even get in. We can't even get in. What are we going to do? You know what? They didn't even call a meeting with the deacons, the finance committee, trustees or anybody. They just got those, that old boy and put him on a stretcher and took him up there and got up there, and they couldn't get in the house. And they said, what are we going to do? You know, most of us said, well, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> you know, really concerned. We'll come back tomorrow. We'll get him down here tomorrow. But not those fellas. 
They were so concerned with a passion in their heart because of his need and his own concern that he was willing to go with them. And they said, well, the only thing I know to do, there's a hammer laying over there. There's a crowbar over there. There's a ladder over there. Let's take him on top of the house. And they said, what are you going to do on top of the house? And they said, we'll tie the roof off of it to get him to Jesus. I wish God's people could get concerned enough, if necessary, take the roof off of the house to get people saved. They got, I don't know how they got up that ladder, and I don't ask me. I don't know. It just says they went up on top of the house. I can't hardly climb a ladder by myself. Must left four men going up that ladder. But it says they got him up on top of the house, and they laid him down, and they began to tear those shingles off. Well, he's coming off. Don't you know that landlord? Don't you know he was wringing his hands? And he was saying, no, please don't do that. That's 200 of us going down the drain. And those four men said, don't make any difference. This man, we got to get him to Jesus. Don't make any difference what it costs. We'll pay for it. They cut that hole out just right. And they let that man down right in front of Jesus. You know what Jesus said? He said, thy faith has made thee whole. Oh, it made a difference when Jesus passed by. It makes a difference. He'll transform your life. He'll change your life. He'll transform your family. He'll transform every being of your body if you'll let him just have your life tonight. I think of a man who rebelled against God, had tried everything in the world in Flint, Michigan. I had won so many alcoholics to the Lord when I first got saved that they came out and bestowed upon me a deputy sheriff for the rest of my life. And every three years, they fly anywhere I'm at and give me a new bag, a new card. I was out visiting one day. I visited this family. This man cussed me out and called me everything, said, don't you ever put your foot on my property again. Now, you hear that? And I said, yes, sir. I said, I want to have prayer for you. And he said, well, go ahead. It won't do any good. And I prayed, and I said, I'm going to ask God to let me have the honor and the privilege of pointing you to the Lord in, in, in a month's time. And he said, I don't believe that junk. He said, I'm not going to get saved. He said, the Lord can't do anything for me. I said, if he ever passes your way, he'll melt your heart. He'll melt your heart. You know what? One month from that date, I was riding in the, in the police car with a friend of mine, Brother George Bowler. One day we received a call to go over to a certain section of the city. We got over there, and here was a, an old Chevrolet car. A little boy had started across the road, eight years old, on a bicycle. And this old Chevrolet car hit him, knocked him down, and the entire body and frame of that car was resting on his head and his little body. And George and I, through fear, we lifted the car off of the body. But this time the blood was flowing from that little boy's head and from his body. But this time there was a huge crowd gathering around. And I picked that little boy up in my arms and I then began to cuddle him in my arms. And George got on the radio and called the ambulance. And all the crowd was gathered around and I got to looking. And I said, where is the mama and daddy of this little boy? And who do you think it was? That same daddy that said, go to heaven. Put your foot on my property again. He said, I am the daddy of that little boy. I could have said, I told you so. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You may not let Jesus pass by you tonight, but you may have to pay a price for him to come by. This man, we rushed that little boy to the hospital. We got there, and I said, Dad, will you and your wife trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? And he said, no, I don't want anything to do with the Lord. And he said, please don't talk to me. The doctor came out and he said, there's no hope for the little boy. Again, I asked that father and that mother if they would accept Christ so they could pray. And again, they repeated the same thing with the, with the words of bitterness and hate against the word of God and against God's man. They said, I don't want anything to do with having the Lord as my Savior. Finally, the next day or two, the doctor came out and he said, well, the little boy has got a chance of 50-50. And I said, Dad, would you please, would you trust the Lord so you can pray for that little boy? 
And he said, Preacher, no. He said, I don't want the Lord to pass by and save me. I don't want to ever be saved. And I stayed with him day and night, day and night for a whole week. I stayed right in the waiting room. And finally, the doctor came out the next day. This was about the fourth or fifth day. The doctor came out and he said, could I see you folks alone? And they said, yes. And he said, Reverend, you go with us too, please. And we went in a little waiting room there. And that doctor said, I want to tell you, I've got some good news. And I've got some bad news. And he told that wife and that husband and that mother and that father, said, you need to be seated. They got him a seat there and waited for the news. And the doctor told them, said, your little boy is going to live. And that mother and that father began crying. And that doctor said, and the bad news is this. He said, the boy will have to have some work on his face. He said, one eye is down here and one ear is dropped down. And he said, he'll be paralyzed on his right side. And he said, the, well, the bad news is that his brain has been damaged. And he said, he'll never develop over eight years old. I said, Dad and Mother, what do you say? That dad literally fell on his face in that waiting room, and the wife fell on her face, and he said, Oh, God, he said, what a price to pay for you to pass by our home. But he said, Oh, God, he said, I want to thank you for Carl being patient with us and trying to plead with us to let Jesus pass by and transform our lives. What a price to pay to let Jesus pass by. Oh, it made a difference in that family. They was for month after month that I received letters from this little fella. And he always used to be right-handed. He couldn't write right-handed because he's paralyzed. And he'd write with his left hand. And he'd say, Preacher, I love you. Preacher, I love you. Thank you. He said it like this. Thank you for saving mommy and daddy. He thought I saved. I have those letters at home tonight. They're in a safe deposit box. There's not enough money in the world to buy those letters. When I get down in the valley discouraged, when I feel like the world is closing in on me, I go to that safe deposit box and I pull out a letter for you. And I say it's worth it all. Oh, it'll make a difference. Let me give you somebody else that made a difference when Jesus passed by. His name is Zacchaeus. In chapter 19 of the book of Luke, Zacchaeus, I often wondered, why did he want to see Jesus? He was a tax collector. He beat people out of every dime and dollar he could because he was after their money. Zacchaeus went around all these people that I mentioned tonight. Now, this may not be good theology, but we don't need theology. We need neology anyway. Zacchaeus went around all these people and, and said, Now I'm here to collect your back taxes and I want my money and I want it now. And every one of them gave him the same story. The one with that little blind boy, the one with that blind son said, Zacchaeus, we're spending every dime we can on this boy trying to get his eyesight. If you'll come back in a month, we'll have the money for you. He went from there and he went down to this man that had the infirmity for 38 years and he heard the same story from his wife. We're spending every dime trying to get his body taken care of. Zacchaeus went from there to Mark chapter 2. That man that had the palsy and that wife came and said, Mr. Zacchaeus, we're spending every dime we can trying to get this palsy taken care of in his body. And then he went down to this woman that had the issue of blood 
And he said, I'm here to collect my back taxes. And she said, Mr. Zacchaeus, I spent every dime, every dime that I've got, and my body and my blood is getting worse and worse and worse. And said, if you'll come back in a month, I'll have your money for you. And Zacchaeus left there with angry and mad, and he said, I'm going to get my money. And he goes down to Mary and Martha, and he said, I'm here to collect my back taxes. And they said, listen, our brother just died. We're having to spend every dime on the funeral. If you'll come back in a month, we'll pay you. Mr. Zacchaeus waited a month, and he goes back and makes his same round. Can't you imagine how he felt when he went up to this home of this boy that was blind, and he knocked on the door, and instead of that mother and father coming to meet Mr. Zacchaeus, here comes a nice, fine, husky-looking boy, and he walked up, and he said, Well, Mr. Zacchaeus, he said, I recognized you, boy. Mr. Zacchaeus said, What happened to you? And he said, Haven't you heard? He said, I met a man that passed by, and his name was Jesus, and he opened my eyes, and I got 20-20 vision. Mr. Zacchaeus, here's your money. Mr. Zacchaeus goes down to that man that had the infirmity for 38 years, and he knocked on the door. And instead of that wife coming to the door, here comes that dad. And he met Mr. Zacchaeus at the door, and he said, Well, how are you, Mr. Zacchaeus? And Mr. Zacchaeus said, what in the world happened to you? He said, for 38 years I've been collecting these back taxes, and you've been dead fast, not able to get off of your back, and now you come to the door. What, what in the world's happened? Oh, he said, haven't you heard, Mr. Zacchaeus? He said, I went down to the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus said, get up and get out of here. And he said, I've been walking ever since. And he said, I don't have any pain. <laughs> Zacchaeus scratched his head. Whew, never seen anything like this. He went down to this woman that had the issue of blood, and he knocked on the door, and she'd always come to the door like this to pay her bill, you know. And that month that she come and said, come back next month, and Mr. Zacchaeus knocked on the door, and she came all straightened up and walking and frisky, and Mr. Zacchaeus said, what happened to you? And she said, oh, haven't you heard? He said, no, what happened? Oh, she said, Jesus passed by the other day. And I reached out and touched the hem of his garment, and I was made whole. And said, Mr. Zacchaeus, look at me. No pain in my body. No pain in my body. And then Mr. Zacchaeus goes down to the man that had the palsy, and by this time he scratched his head, and then finally he went down and knocked on the door of Mary and Martha, and who do you think comes to the door? Lazarus. Lazarus come to the door and said, well, hello, Mr. Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus said, whew. He said, what happened? He said, I was by here last month and you were dead. He said, they spent every dime on your funeral and now here you are. Oh, he said, haven't you heard? He said, they put me under the ground and covered me. And he said, I heard a voice. said, Zacchaeus. And he said, Zacchaeus, it was Jesus that called me. He hollered and said, Lazarus. And I came out of the grave, and old Zacchaeus said, I never heard anything like this. And old Zacchaeus, he run back to the office, and he got in there, and those fellas said, Zacchaeus, have you heard? And he said, heard what? Oh, haven't you heard? He said, no, what? And they said, Jesus is passing through Jericho. And he said, you don't mean it. And they said, yeah, he's coming too. Said, he's coming through Jericho. I can see Zacchaeus now. He throws those books down, throws that pen down. And he said, I'm going to see this man that performed all these miracles, that raised that man from the grave. I want to meet him personally and get acquainted with him. Old Zacchaeus run, and he said, I don't know what direction, but I believe he's going to come down that lane. And he went down that lane. He found him a sycamore tree. And he got up in that sycamore tree, and he looked, and he kept looking, and finally he got a glimpse of Jesus, and he said, here they come, here they come. Now, Zacchaeus was a little bitty fellow, and he looked, and he said, here they come, here they come. And he was so anxious to see Jesus. And finally, when Jesus got under that sycamore tree, and he looked up, and he said, Zacchaeus, he said, make haste and come now. I'm going home to eat dinner with you. <laughs> 
Oh, man, that'll make a Baptist shout. What if, let me ask you tonight. What if he said that to you? What if Jesus passed by tonight and said, I'm going to go home with you? Oh, you'd beat him home, wouldn't you? You'd try to beat him home and you'd try to clean up your house. Oh, you'd try to get rid of some of the filth that's in there. You'd change your language. You'd change your filthy jokes and you'd change all this and all that. Could Jesus walk in your house tonight without any cleaning up? Could he? Could he walk in your home tonight with a husband and wife? When it comes time to go to bed, could he, see, could he wait there and see that you open the Bible and read the Word of God to your children? Could you open, could he hear you having your family altar? See, I know tonight in five minutes, I know in five minutes that my wife is kneeling, reading the Bible with my four children. I know that. I know that when I'm gone, she carries on. And it has been for 20 years that we haven't missed that night of opening the Word of God and reading to our children and getting on our knees and praying, Oh, God, take our children and use them. All my children have surrendered their life already except little John just got saved. Here a few weeks ago, I started to leave, and we have a two-story house. I was coming down the stairs, and little John was standing up there. He was crying. He's five years old. He come running and put his arms around me. He said, Daddy, why do you leave us every week? Why do you leave us every week? And I said, John, Daddy's got to go get some people saved. Every day when he prays, when I'm home, he said, Lord, bless the revival today. Whether I'm in a revival or not, he said, bless the revival. I called home last week, one of the greatest joy. My phone bill averages $150 to $200 a month. I don't know, maybe I ought to go back to pastoring. I called home the other night, and little John was on the phone, and he just cried. My wife was on the other line, and she's crying. And he said, Daddy, you know what happened? And I said, what happened, John? He said, Daddy, I just got saved tonight. I just asked Jesus to come to my heart. And he said, Daddy, I'm like you now. I'm not afraid to die. Five years old. Oh, listen, it makes a difference when Jesus passes by. He'll change you. He'll transform you. You think I enjoy being an evangelist? You ask Doc Lakin. Oh, listen, I've got to do what God wants me to do, but I'd rather, I, my, my brother, preacher, I'd rather be home tonight with my babies. But like I told little John, there's people need to be saved. Maybe God can use me to get some of them saved. It makes a difference when Jesus passes by. Will you let him pass by you tonight? I think about the, one of the greatest songwriters that's ever been known. I was looking in your book as soon as I found out I was going to preach, and I was looking in your book, just some of the songs, and I just jotted them down. Fanny Crosby is one of the greatest songwriters ever been known. She was blind physically. At the age of six weeks old, they tried to restore her sight and did everything, they, humanly speaking, they could, and they could not restore her sight. Fanny Crosby was blind physically, but she could see spiritually. I want you to listen to some of the songs in your book. It says, I am thine, O Lord. Praise him, praise him. Redeemed, blessed assurance, saved by grace. Tell me the story of Jesus. All the way my Savior leads me. Savior, more than life. Closer to thee, Jesus is calling. Then one of the greatest songs that was ever put on paper by the pen of Fanny Crosby was, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others are calling, please don't pass me by. Oh, my prayer tonight, he'll pass by some of these teachers, some of these superintendents, some of these deacons, and some of these workers. He'll pass by these Christians and lay on their hearts. 
their need. I want to tell you this in closing. The friends of mine, their little boy that had their, his eyes operated on, the doctor said he may not ever see again, but he said we'll perform the operation and then trust God. The little boy was only about eight years old, and the doctor performed the surgery. Then after he put the bandages around his head, around his eyes, and he told the mother and father, he said, now, when the time comes, he said, I'll come and assist in taking off the bandages. He said, if he's exposed to light too rapidly, he could lose his eyesight again. And so when the time came, the doctor came over to the house, and he, the one day he took one bandage off, and the next day he'd take another bandage off. And that father was standing over against the wall, and, and, and the tears of sorrow and the tears of joy running together. And he said, I know that my boy will want to see me first because I'm the one that played ball with him. I'm the one that took him fishing. That mother standing over there wringing her hands, and she said, I know I'm the one that he'll want to see. I'm the one that curled him in my arms. I'm the one that walked the floor with him when he had the tummy ache. I'm the one he'll want to see. Every day they repeated the same sentences, and every day that doctor would take a bandage off, and finally that last day for that last bandage to be taken off, that father standing over there, and he's crying, saying, I know I'm the one he'll want to see. That mother standing over there, saying, I know I'm the one he'll want to see. The doctor took the bandage off, and he stood back at the foot of the, of the wall of the room, and he said, Son, open your eyes gradually. And that little boy opened his eyes gradually and looked over at his mother and his father, and he ran and jumped in the arms of that doctor. And he said, you're the one that I want to hug and kiss. And you're the one I want to see. You're the one that performed the operation. I want to see Jesus most of all because he's the one that performed the operation on me 20 years ago. Oh, I want to see my daddy. When I went to my father's funeral, Stood over his body, didn't know who it was, because I was drunk, so drunk I didn't know. My brother told me, said, a little while later when I'd come to my senses, he said, did you know Papa died? And I said, no, I didn't know it. I was in another room. And he said, Papa's dead. He's out there in the room. And I went out in the room and looked at my father's body. First time I'd recognized him to his day. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing Papa. He's in heaven tonight. I got a brother that I've never had the privilege of putting my arm around him. Slipped out of his life before I got to see him. And I'm looking forward to seeing him. But I'm looking forward most of all to seeing Jesus. Why? Because he performed the operation 20 years ago. Tonight, he wants to perform the operation on you. If you're here tonight, husband, wife, son, or daughter, you're lost without Jesus Christ, he wants to save you. If you're here, teenager, he wants to save you. Whatever need might be in your life tonight, let Jesus pass by. Some of you people tonight are just as unconcerned about lost people. You got unsaved loved ones, and you've never really laid them on the altar and said, Oh God, whatever is necessary, save them. Whatever is necessary. Bow your heads, please.